Welcome to Conversations with Karalia, where we take a nuanced deep dive into all things related to spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. My name is Karalia, and I'm your host for this journey. I invite you to relax back, open up, and get curious. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share the love. Alrighty, folks. So welcome to Conversations with Karalia. Today on the show, I have AJ Hendry. And I've been following AJ for a while on Instagram. That's where I first came across him and love the clarity with which he speaks. Now, AJ is a youth worker and a writer, and his big mission is to end youth homelessness here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. He is a theology graduate and a Christian. So he's quite often writing about not quite like what would Jesus do, but he's he's working in this zone between coming from a Christian perspective, referencing the teachings of Jesus, whilst also working within the you know ending homelessness space as well. Uh, and he explores the intersection between faith and justice. So this is one of the reasons why I wanted to speak to AJ. A, he's really articulate on this. And B, it's not that often that I come across people working in like the not-for-profit sector, et cetera, or the government sector who are very obviously Christian and not just Christian, but also calling out the way that Christianity is often portrayed. Um, for example, he will sometimes talk about things like the way that Christians will marginalize or oppress or just be downright nasty to members of our rainbow community and as he puts it he's like look Jesus would be the first one in there saying we need to support love protect and care for those who are vulnerable in our community those who are marginalized so I'm really curious to see where this particular conversation goes um, as you all know the topics that I cover on conversations with Carolia are spirituality, sexuality, awakening, and liberation, and power, right? Power is a big part of it as well. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, stay tuned, as always, right to the very end, where I'll offer some reflections on the conversation. And let's see what AJ has to say. All righty. Welcome, folks. I'm here with AJ Hendry. Aaron, Aaron, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Pretty good. Um, where in the world are you? If you want to locate uh, yourself for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, look, ko, ko Take, ko Itari, ko Tarangi, um, ko Ingari, uh, ko Whakapapa Rangamai, um, ko Te Rangate Puna, Te Whenua Tapu, ko Messi Te Kainga. Um, yeah, so I yeah I come from like a bit of a mixed whakapapa. I identify as Tanga ta, ta, ta Um My whakapapa kind of comes from like I'm Turkish, Italian, Scottish, Irish, English, kind of that mix. Um, so a lot of different threads that kind of bring me into this space. Um, I grew up in West Auckland, like Riverhead, Coatesville, um, quite far out as a kid. Grew up in a little like small community with my whānau out there. Um, but Massey in West Auckland is really my home. That's where I really, yeah, I feel most connected. That's where um, all my whānau live now, those who are in Tamaki. Um, we all live in West Auckland. That's where my church is. That's where my community is. Um, that's where I feel the most connected at the moment. And um, yeah, I've got a little, um, yeah, three little beautiful boys, um, a five-year-old, a two-year-old, and a seven-month-old. And Holy. so, they, <laughs> yeah, they kept me. Uh, they keep me pretty, pretty busy. So, you know, if they bash through the door, um, they may want to join us at some point during the conversation. But we'll see. Uh, um, so you, yeah. Perfect. And so, what's the work? Actually, before we go into the work that you do, this is a question I've started to ask people when they first come on. What's your world view? How do you perceive? reality what are, what are your lenses so, so you just want to start with a small one okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh yeah I mean there's so much to unpack in that um and, and I'm sure we will as we go in um I guess like in terms of my spirituality my faith you know um I fuck up to you know the story of Christianity and and then I guess the story for me 
is the story of like a marginalized Jew who, you know, suffered colonization um, and spoke up against the injustice of that in, in his world and his time. Um, and so, you know, he was someone who kind of stood up against injustice and stood for love and stood for, you know, the equality of all people. Um, and so that really frames my worldview, you know, this narrative, this story of actually every human being bears the image of the divine. Every human being is worthy, every, you know, throughout all of creation, throughout everything, you know, we look around us, it is teeming with, you know, the, 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 the touch of divinity, you know, that we see the divine image in all things. Um, so I guess that's kind of where I start from, that actually everything and everyone has value and has purpose and that as human beings, we are our most human when we love, when we love mm. others, when we care for others, that, that is when we're being more, most human. You know, that's what it means to live out of this divine image is to care for others and to love them. Um, so I guess that's kind of where I start from. Um, and yeah. there's so much we could talk about in that. Yeah, yeah, that's ever That gives me a pretty clear idea of your worldview. So what's the work that you are engaged with? What's your mahi? Yeah, so I mean, I'm a, I'm a youth worker. Um, I am very much engaged with supporting rangatahi that are structurally marginalized on the margins of society. I do that in a range of different ways, both through leading services and developing services that can respond to need. You know, a real big focus of mine is around ending and preventing youth homelessness. Basically, youth homelessness is one of these issues where you know, wherever we can fail people, you know, every sort of gap in our systems, you know, young people end up who experience homelessness are some of our most structurally marginalized people in society, right? Um, so it's a real focus of mine. Um, you know, I'm also a writer, you know, I write fairly regularly around a whole range of issues, but again, you know, focusing around how we can, you know, build a better world for our fun, mm. for our community, for our young people. And um, yeah, I'm also a podcaster as well. So I, I do, and you know, advocacy. So I do a, a bunch of different things, but very yeah. much focused on on these big systemic issues and how we serve our young people. Yeah. I mean, that's how I first came across you was on Instagram. And I loved how articulate you were around all of these different issues. Um, so some, I know that a lot of my listeners or watchers won't necessarily be aware of the extent of youth homelessness here in Aotearoa. Can you share with us yeah, what is the extent, what do you see, how do young people end up homeless here in this country? It's one of those massive issues that you know has just not gotten a lot of attention. So I've been involved in the Kopapa for, I mean, since I became a youth worker. Formerly, the community's really started to organise over the last five years. I've been really privileged to be part of a collective called Manaka Rangatahi that is organising to push back and, and to kind of try to articulate some solutions. But one of the gaps we have is because it's been one of those hidden issues, it hasn't really got the attention in terms of research and development. Um, but, you know, we do know that services in the community are turning away young people every day because they don't have the housing or the services that they need, you know, um, about, you know, we look at our homeless population, we look at the most recent census data, about 50% of all those who experience homelessness are young people under 25 years of age. Um, you know, we also know that one in 10 young people transitioning out of care or out of a youth justice residence are experiencing homelessness. A, a survey done by Youth19 showed that 29% of those they surveyed in high school were experiencing homelessness. And, and the most recent data coming up out of the Growing Up in New Zealand study um, showed that about um, one 14 uh, children would experience homelessness between the age of 8 and 12 years. Um, so we have this growing sort yeah. of data around the issue and, and on the ground, if you speak to youth workers, if you speak to, um, you know, the very few youth housing homelessness services in, in the country, you know, they'll tell you that largely they're overwhelmed. They don't have the services um, in yeah. place to really adequately support them. And, and often young people reach out and we don't have safe places to house them. So, yeah, it's a, it's a big issue. It's a growing issue. And it's one yeah. that's been ignored for, for far too long. So how is homelessness defined? If you're saying 29% of high school students are experiencing or have experienced homelessness, how is that being defined? Yeah, so so in Aotearoa, we define homelessness um, uh, through a range of different things. So, you know, it's it's housing instability. So it could be yeah. that a young person is couch surfing. So they're moving from place to place fairly regularly. They don't have a fixed the boat. Um, it could be that they're living in really inadequate housing. So they're in like a garage or they're in an abandoned building. You know, once again, it's not a fixed mm -hmm. the boat. It's, it's, it's not proper housing. Um, they could be sleeping in a car. You know, they could be, you know, in the worst case scenario, they're on the street, rough sleeping. Um, they could be an emergency accommodation, right? Um, um, so, so it's it's that sort of um, that sort of thing. 
a whole wide range. It, it, yeah. What's that like for you as a youth worker when you are interacting with young people that are experiencing, like, how does it feel? Yeah, it's pretty, heart. Heart. It's, yeah. it's pretty heartbreaking, you know. Um, <laughs> I remember the first time that I really became aware of how big the issue was. I was a young youth worker and, you know, come up against housing and security before as, a, you know, most of us as youth workers start off as volunteers, right? And, and I got my first professional job, you know, professional, which meant, just meant I got paid to do the thing that I was doing all the time. Um, <laughs> and I remember a young person turning up to our office and it was a Friday night, like I've got nowhere to go and I'm faced with this prospect of having to turn this child basically onto the street. And I thought, well, obviously we'll have a system in place for this, you know? And I remember I rung up MSD and you know, said, look, I've got this young 16 year old, I've got nowhere to go, you know, where can we put them? And I said, oh, sorry, you know, they're 16, we can't, we can't house them, we can't help them. And, you know, I rung Oranga Tauruki after that, it's the same thing, sorry, 16, you know, they're not in care, we can't help them. And, you know, it was a real confronting, you know, uh, reality that actually as a, as a society, we haven't actually set up the infrastructure necessary to ensure that those young people are safe. Um, and, and then from a personal perspective, as a youth worker, it's, a, it's, it's heartbreaking, you know, you, you've got that yeah. child right in front of you, you know, um, and, and that prospect of having to turn someone off into the street is, uh, yeah, it, it breaks your heart. Um, and, and I know my colleagues, people I work with every day, you know, you see the emotional toll it has on, yeah. on us, you know, because at the end of the day, you care about these kids and um, we know that they're suffering as a result of, what is basically political decisions we've made over generations not to adequately care for them. Mm. Let's talk about that because that's one of the things I've heard you say a few times that inequity is structurally created and poverty is a political choice. What do you mean by poverty yeah. is a political choice? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, basically, it's that every day, well, every day, you know, we make decisions about what we prioritize, what we put our resources in to how we design and develop our community and our society. Um, and, and a lot of these big issues, they get created by the decisions that we make around how we organize our society, organize our resources and organize what we invest our resources into. Um, I mean, if we talk about youth homelessness again, um, in terms of that structural creation, one really great example of that was, I might get a little bit technical here, but basically the creation of the youth payment, which was basically a, a youth payment that was created for young people that, um, for whatever reason, couldn't live at home, right? So previous national government, I think it was back in 2008, said, look, we've got all these young people that are on the benefit, but they're, they're not going to school. They're not, you know, so we need to find a way to support them. Um, and they created the youth payment. And the idea was that you would provide them with a youth worker. Um, you'd support them to get into education and you'd support them to, you know, do some budgeting and, and that sort of thing. And so, you know, some of that was pretty good. But the but the motivation for that was, hey, they're not in school. We need to get them into school. What they didn't understand was actually a lot of those young people were experiencing homelessness. And what was never provided was housing. And so we had an opportunity, you know, where we could have in the very structures that we created at that moment and that point in time where the government, if they had understood what they were doing and listened to those young people and what were, you know, advocates there, uh, they could have created a whole system that would have responded to housing and homelessness back in 2008. They didn't do that. Mm. And what we ended up creating was, uh, you know, a benefit system where you had a whole bunch of youth workers across the country serving homeless young people with no housing to put them in. Um, and just perpetuating the harm. And so that was a structural issue. You know, if we talk again about, I talked about one in 10 young people are transitioning out of care, right? Mm -hmm. And in youth justice system, and they're experiencing homelessness, right? So we know that that's a key pipeline. Young people, mm -hmm. when they transition out of care, or when they leave a justice system, the justice system, there's a huge risk of homelessness there. We know that a, that a range of them are experiencing housing instability before they go into the system. They're going to be experiencing on the other side. Um, what we could be doing is resourcing that properly to ensure that we have the right programs in place to ensure that every one of those young people has the opportunity for a supportive housing service when they leave. Right. We haven't done that. There's about 153 places for those one in 10, you know, I imagine uh, coming out of a youth, I imagine coming out of the youth justice facility that it would be quite challenging, even in the private rental market to land accommodation in terms of references yeah. or, you know, et cetera, that yeah, people yeah. would be reluctant to rent to someone, a young person coming out of a justice facility, for example. 
Uh, well, yeah, you know, there's already discrimination because you're young. Um, yeah. And some of these young people have some very complex sort of like trauma backgrounds, you know, yeah. struggling with addiction and mental illness, and they need a little bit of extra support actually to heal. The justice system itself is not a healing environment and yeah. often, you know, increases trauma. Um, and so when they're coming back into that community, we hear constant stories of young people being placed in really unsafe spaces and then going back into you know the justice system or going straight onto the street and again it's that same pipeline and so again that's a structural choice not to ensure that we have the resources in place to support those young people but does the government have the resources or do they have the ability to set up supported housing or that kind of housing for to, for people coming out or young people coming out of the justice system yeah, I mean, in terms of ability, yeah, there's there's community services across the motu that um, are organizing and are providing op options if they had the funding to upscale and get it done. Um, resources, that's what I mean about political choices, right? We mm. make political choices about where we put our resources, also around how we, you know, organize our tax system, how we, you know, redistribute yeah. wealth in this country. Um, so yes, is the resource there? Potentially. Um, are we willing to reform our tax system to ensure that we do have the resources mm. we need to redistribute that wealth to ensure that we actually provide everyone with their basic human rights? Yeah. That's a political choice we make. Mm. So if we kind of zoom right out, right, because sometimes it can feel quite overwhelming in the, in the details of all of this. If we zoom out, like, you know, I'm in my mid 40s. I grew up in this country and it does feel like as a community, things are getting worse. You know, there wasn't the degree of homelessness that I recall, you know, in the 80s or necessarily in the 90s. In that zoom out, do you think the way that we've just constructed society is basically just failing us completely? Yeah, I, I, look, <laughs> like, I, I think, you know, I think essentially, I think individualism has been an experiment that has not served us well. Um, yeah. You know, we've really structured our society on this, you know, myth of meritocracy, this myth of individuality. The reality is we're, we're communal beings as human beings. You know, we're, yeah. we're far more connected to each other when we realize. And actually human beings thrive when we are connected to one another, mm. when we're in communities, where we're, you know, in relationship with one another. The more individualized we become, the, the weaker our communities are, the more gaps for people to fall through. Um, so yeah, I, I think how we've structured our society is, is not helpful. You know, it doesn't yeah. help us see one another, know one another. Um, if you think about, you know, I guess the political upheaval that has happened over the last few years, um, and is, is playing out in the headlines every day at the moment. Um, a lot of that comes from the reality that we're just so far apart from each other that we, yeah. we lack empathy for one another because we don't know one another. Uh, and yeah. I think that's a huge risk for us as a community. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a lot of um, power that happens when we are in relationship with each other, when we're in community, and where people from different walks of life can actually, um, you know, hear each other's stories and mm. see each other's humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I guess something that really exposes this is this conversation around youth crime, right? It's been playing yeah. out in the media over the last few years, and we've seen adults publicly, you know, getting up with no empathy, throwing stones at children who are, you know, who are, if we're real, are, are victims of abuse, who have been abused by people as children and abused by the state, and then have gone on to do some real terrible things. Mm -hmm. Yet there's a there's a failure to acknowledge actually what led those children to to get to where they were and one of the big hypocrisies we have in this country is we have so much compassion for children when they're abused but we have no empathy for those children when we continue to abuse them and then they become the teenagers that cause mm. harm in our community mm. we need to draw that connection together that actually look yeah as a society, these are human beings that actually have yeah. gone through some of the worst of life and we can do so much more to protect them and our wider communities mm. I wonder sometimes, you know, look at politicians and things that politicians say in terms of like, let's get tough on crime. They seem to be operating from this idea that crime is a choice. And, you know, it's quite an edgy thing to say that people aren't necessarily making choices. They're being reactive according to their conditioning, according to their trauma, according to all of those different things going on. Um yeah, I, I think when I hear that rhetoric, I often I, I often think you've never you've never seen someone in the cycle of trauma, right? Um, yeah. You know, and a lot of the crime we're talk, talking about, you know, everything we would, would any research you look at says that actually tough penalties and really hard lines 
don't actually stop it from happening because often those young people are in situations where they're reacting to their trauma or they're reacting to what's yeah. going on for them or they're trying to meet really basic human needs that aren't getting met and so the tough penalties all they do is just exacerbate all that they also don't teach lessons this is where like restorative justice can be really powerful when done well because mm. it actually is victim centric it brings the the center to the, at the center of a true restorative justice system is the is is the victim the person who's been harmed mm -hmm. but the question is how do we restore community how do we restore you know one another to each other and how do we right the wrong that has been done like that's a real core mm. part of restorative justice process yeah a lot of people um think that victims are served through our punitive justice system they're not they're completely cut out of the system what is served is the state the state says this is what i'm going to do and they charge forward and do it no matter what the victim actually wants um the, the current system is not serving victims despite yeah. the rhetoric yeah because i i you know there's very few criminals who stop or very very few people that when they're about to do something criminal that will stop and go oh, i shouldn't do this because i'm gonna experience you know this particular tough stance on it that's not it's just not how humans function yeah <laughs> Yeah, and and, uh, and again, like this is this is again when we come back to political choices, you know what we know of these sorts of crimes that we're talking about. You know, crimes that happen in the moment. Young people, um, they are often reactionary. They're coming through trauma, coming through just, you know what's happening in their, their lived environment. Um, but we don't treat you know you know tax fraud the same way, or you know wealthy. You know, uh, yeah. you know, those sorts of crimes are far more, oh, you know, we don't have the same conversation where those may be far more premeditated and being committed by people that actually have thought three things through and are in a different, you know, it's, a, it's an abuse yeah. of power rather than someone on the bottom of society who has no power reacting to that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the way we frame white collar crime, as they call it, mm -hmm. and the way we frame, you know, youth crime, completely different. Yet we ask the question, who actually holds the power? in these different situations mm, mm -hmm. yeah when I see the politicians you know like coming down and saying yeah tough on crime etc my sense is that people see the news they see you know youth crime happening it makes them feel scared and so yeah. what they're looking for here is not actually a solution to the crime and why it's happening but what they're looking for is to not feel scared so when the politician comes along and says we'll get tough on crime the person's like Oh, feel now I feel taken care of. I don't feel so scared. And it's got actually nothing to do with what will work on the ground, but about that dialogue between the politicians trying to make us feel okay about shit. And again, who are they speaking to? When you're having that conversation, who's listening to that? There's a there's a percentage of people that respond to that rhetoric who actually are not at risk predominantly of being victims of this crime. Mm. Um and at the end of the day, it's not going to serve those who are victims of this crime, right? Mm. It, and it just perpetuates these cycles of violence. You know, prison itself is a very violent place. You know, if you think yeah. about the way that it is designed, the impact that it has, and it does not just harm that individual that goes there. Once again, we're collective beings, right? Yeah. The impact of incarcerating someone has an impact on the whanau at large, has an impact on the kids in that community. A whole community is impacted by incarcerating one individual. Mm. Um, it creates further harm in our community and you can only lock people up for so long. Eventually they come out. And if we still yeah. have those needs unmet, if people mm -hmm. are still traumatized and harmed and still living out of that cycle, then yeah. it is just going to continue to happen. You know? So where does personal responsibility come in here? Like, yeah. yeah right. I, because it's I, one thing to live through yeah. trauma and all of, all of those things, et cetera, addiction, mental health issues. Where does personal responsibility come in? Yeah, I, I think personal responsibility has a really important role. Uh, I, the way I often talk about personal responsibility is that first, it, it's it's personal for responsibility can be discussed um, in the, within collective responsibility. So I think there's a collective responsibility we have to hold. And when we hold that well, then we can have a really good conversation around personal responsibility. Mm. Um, you know, when I, when I see young people who have been provided with their basic needs, you know, the young people that I've worked with, and we've managed to house them, when we've provided support around them, when we've you know given them an opportunity to actually to face the consequences of their action and then make different choices, they're actually empowered to make a choice. You know, whether that is to you know acknowledge what they've done and try to make amends, or turn away from that and continue down the path they're on. But we've dealt with the basic needs, and now they're making a choice rather than living out of that cycle of trauma and pain. You know. Mm. 
And so mm. when we deal with our collective responsibility, we actually enable personal responsibility to occur. I like that. When we deal with our collective responsibility, we enable personal responsibility to occur. So the young people that you work with, do they feel good about themselves? Do they feel cared for by the community? Do they feel like the people give a shit about them? Do they feel valued? Yeah, well, I, I hope the ones that I serve do, um, for me yeah. at least. Um, I, I think it's it's huge, right? So it's, many of the rangatai that I serve come from some of the most structurally marginalized backgrounds of being really harmed. And, you know, again, we look at the media, they've been told yeah. that they're rubbish and they're worth nothing every single day. Um, many of our young people don't feel like they have a stake in our society. They don't yeah. think we care about them. Um, and when you look at their lives, the fact that they have... You know, many have, have been transient most of their lives. They've reached out for help and been, you know, kicked to the curb and, and left on the street. And the only, the only reason anyone ever cares about them is when they've done something wrong and want to lock them up. You know, I mean, mm. yeah, if that what was kind your, of messages does that send? If, if that was your reality and then people said, oh, you should take personal responsibility and care about your society. Well, the message is, well, you guys haven't cared about us, you know? Yeah. And, and so there's a, there's a big conversation that needs to be had around inequality. Um, in Aotearoa and, and actually mm. do we really care uh, are we just concerned around punishing people or do we actually want to look at why this stuff is happening and, yeah. and, and again like I think of a young guy that I know that's you know ended up in the justice system and like he he experienced po his whole family experienced poverty for much of his young life experienced abuse basically uh the court said oh yeah, something needs to change in your life send him to an emergency hotel where again, it's not a great environment. He's still living in poverty. He ends up, you know, falling into the same patterns and he's back in the system, you know, and all they want to do is throw the book at him and get him and, you know, incarcerate him. Mm. I mean, there's not much hope there, right? Yeah, um, and, so and tough it's, to cycle. Yeah, and yeah. the world feels like it's against you. It feels like actually yeah. the state, everyone around you hates you. And so yeah. that's what you get as a response, right? Um, yeah. This is the interesting thing, right? Because, you know, the world that I walk in a lot, the yoga, well-being, transformational festivals, et cetera, there's a lot around the way that you perceive reality is often what you experience. And it's not that that you're totally creating the world, but you're creating your experience of the world. Um, and so I work with a lot of people who are doing deep internal work around beliefs, you know, the belief of being unworthy and all of this kind of stuff. Is there any awareness you know, and the realms within which you're working about how our beliefs of ourselves and of the world impact the way we experience reality. I mean, uh, that's definitely part of like, as youth workers reframing for Arangate and helping them to try to work through that is, 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 a, is a definitely a key thing. One of the things I'm really amazed at is some of the Arangate I do meet who are just determined not to let the world destroy them. You know, mm -hmm. I, mean, I spoke to a young man, uh, you know a couple of months back who has been living in emergency accommodation for ages and I thought man this must be really hard and you know expressed that to him he said you know it's all right now I'm gonna he was just he was determined not to give in to despair as hard yeah. as his life was and as hard as the system was trying to crush him he was determined to say look I am gonna I'm gonna pull myself out of this and that was like really amazing and he, fortunately he had some good people around him that you know yeah. hoping to, to kind of help him with that but you know there's definitely you know I'm always amazed at the resilience of our young people and the courage mm -hmm. that they have to face you know what is some really huge systemic issues that is crushing them at times and yet they continue to hold hope and continue to fight and continue to say look I can I can have something better than what the world's given me um and i think that's really cool I, it, it just breaks my heart we talk about resilience and it always breaks my heart the young people have to be named resilient because that means that they've suffered a lot and, yeah. and often they're far too young to have gone through um what they've gone through mm. so when you're dealing with this and you're seeing the way that uh, the system is in essence you know against people how does your faith inform your work your perspective on it all mm yeah yeah um i think it, as i said before like the, the story that i live out of is is the story of um you know a brown indigenous colonized jew who who was essentially you know the most marginalized in his society right and it's the story of the divine stepping into human flesh and solidarity with that oppression you know 
um, to say that actually the divine makes a choice to say, I'm going to step into humanity, but not with the powerful and the rich, but I'm going to be one with those who suffer. I'm going to be one with those who are oppressed. I am going to be one with those who have been excluded and marginalized. And, and that sort of orientates me in terms of my walk, right, in my life and say, look, this is where the divine stance, you know, that actually we have, you know, and in, in my worldview and belief, we have a God that actually loves humanity so much. It's not above us judging us or, you know, cursing us or whatever, but has stepped into our mess and is fighting alongside us for justice. You know, Martin Luther King talks about, you know, the arch of the world is bent towards justice, right? Mm. Um, and so that's what I think I hold on to hope with, you know, amidst all of the muck and the mire that actually, you know, I, I, I talk a little bit about um, this uh, idea of the divine dream becoming reality in our world, that actually mm -hmm. the, the, re the divine dream, the, the way the divine always hoped this world would be, it is becoming reality. And that all of us who are on the side of love and justice are mm -hmm. part of making that so. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, if you're a Christian, Muslim or whatever, like those of us who stand for justice and those of us who stand for love are mm. making this reality come about. And so whichever space we're doing that, that reality is becoming present amongst us. Mm. And that gives me a lot of courage in these spaces to say, look, it may not be perfect and it may not yet be the way I hope it to be, but that actually I'm a part of partnering with divine to make this world the, the way it should be. And, mm. and you know it's happening slowly you know mm. and it happens wherever we care for one another wherever we love one another wherever you know people serve each other you know we mm. start to see this divine dream breaking into our reality yeah i mean that was one of the things that grabbed me about the body of work that you're doing that hashtag that you always use love is the way yeah. what does that mean how do you embody that how do you live that yourself that love yeah. is the way I think that's the thing that holds me. Um, I think it's really easy to, uh, and I speak to like young people wanting to advocate in the space about like, you got to have something to stand on. And I guess that's what I stand on because mm. we can go one or two ways. We can even become so overwhelmed by everything that we just become apathetic and we step away from it and we're just exhausted because there is far too much suffering. And why don't we just disassociate? And then the other side is that we can just rage against the machine, right? We, 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 and in that, in that side, the, the risk there is we start to see human beings as less than human and we start mm. to dehumanize them. And, 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 and when we hate and when we give into that, I think that also has an impact on us. We become less than human in, in our hatred. Um, and so love is the way for me that is, that is the path to walk. It is to, to choose to say, to name injustice to be clear on injustice, to be clear on the systems and structures that are harming our people and our planet. Um, and to say, look, this isn't okay. But also to name that human beings within these structures are still human beings. And mm. that even those who have been captured by ideologies of hate that have been captured by ideologies that cause harm, even they need liberation. And even they um, yeah. need to be freed from that bondage. And so that when, when we can look at someone who maybe has been captured by an ideology that, you know, in my view is really hateful and harmful and distorting even their image, that I can say, see the humanity in that person, choose to love that person and also yeah. not give up on them, believe that actually liberation is possible for them as well. Um, yeah. One of the things that I've, you know, one of my influences is this guy called Naim Atik, and he is a, a liberation theologian from Palestine. Um, and he it was in a real interesting situation where, you know, he's kind of hated from all sides, you know, really hated by the Jewish community, hated by the Christians in the States, um, hated by some of his Muslim brothers. Um, but one of the things that he really held to was that even though we named the oppression that he was experiencing, um, that also those people causing harm needed to be liberated. And so we resist in order to liberate those who have been captured by hate and by racism and, and by harm, you know, mm. believing that they too can be liberated and that there is hope mm. for all the humanity. Mm. I love that. I mean, it's definitely a part of my practice is to not other those who might hold a different perspective or a different from view to me to realize that from their perspective, you know, they're the good person in their story. Like yeah. We're all, all the good person in our stories, right? <laughs> we are. We're all the hero in, in the story, right? <laughs> 
Yeah. And, and I think, and even if we think about how do things change, I I don't believe things ultimately change by shaming people or by throwing yeah. stones at them or by fighting them. You know, I I believe that actually when we come together on a human level and actually meet people mm. where they're at, there's far more opportunity to get lasting change. You know, yeah. we're seeing a bit of a, a wave in society where shame, public shame is being used as a tool to create change. And I guess my concern with that is it may create some semblance of change for a period of time, but it doesn't deal with the hearts and minds. It doesn't yeah. get deep into what's really going on for people. And so whatever that change appears to be, we see, you know, we've seen this over the world, these backlashes when, uh, it, that root cause, that thing that was driving um, that that behavior that people were concerned about or that politic that people were concerned about, it comes back. Mm. Um, there's far more value, I think, in actually meeting people where they're at, having that conversation and then exposing, you know, really harmful ideologies for what they are. I think we have mm. some really shared values as human beings. You know, when mm. we actually get on a human level, most people don't like the idea that children are suffering. Yeah. Most people don't like the idea of kids living on the street you know, of, of children being traumatized, of, you know, families struggling to put food on their table. When you engage people on that level, you can build some form of consensus that you can then work towards around, well, how does your ideology actually meet this need? Is it causing harm or is it actually helping yeah. to serve our young people in our community? And I think that's a really interesting conversation to have rather than you're a villain and I'm the good guy. And that's yeah. just a fight that it's going to go around in circles. Yeah. It's like, again, it's like widening out, getting really curious about the perspective we're holding or like you say, the ideology, et cetera. And is that effective? Is it actually going to bring about solutions? Um, I often think about Jesus on the cross, you know, and there he is and he's suffering immensely. The, the amount of pain, like just, and he's just like, father, forgive them. They know not what they do, you know? And that sense of like, even, yeah, what he brought in that moment, that sense of, we're all doing the best we can with where we're at, with our level of conditioning and our level of trauma. And if we can hold that connectiveness and hold that love, even as maybe we condone the behavior, you know, yeah. or set expectations or set boundaries. Um, yeah, I just wonder sometimes what the political discourse would be like if we really deeply embodied love for each other and curiosity, even as we explored how to organize society in essence, because yeah. isn't that what politics is about? So how do we organize society so it benefits not just those with the power, the vested interests, but all people all the way down? Yeah, sure. Mm, mm. Ah, all righty. So we've got a couple other things I want to touch on in terms of Christianity uh you did a post that got quite a lot of attention and maybe possibly some flack from from different yeah you think you know what i'm about to refer to um, i'm not sure which one actually because i've had a few <laughs> yeah yeah there has been a few when you just talked about um our rainbow community and the flack or the the hatred the oppression that was being directed at trans people by some people who are, are christian and you just came out and said again you were like Dude, Jesus says love everyone. He'd be first in there, right? Um, what was that like for you speaking out on that particular issue? Were you surprised at some of what came back at you? Uh, not surprised, no. Yeah. Uh, I've been engaging in this conversation <laughs> for a little bit. Also, I understand where it comes from. You know, um, within some, within, you know, the, my community, within the Christian community, the Christian faith, the again this is the complexity of the these conversations right you know often it's perceived as you know a bunch of christian fundamentalists that just hate trans people and i know it's really hard because it's that's how it's experienced and the harm is very real from their side this is how they love and and they think you know again if you if you step into their shoes they have a conception of god that is raffled and that that if you don't do the right things if you don't live up to the right model of humanity that they uh, believe is true you're going to burn an eternity for hell and so they believe that rather you know have you hate them today and say what they believe to be true and try to save your soul then let you go and burn in hell for eternity mm, and so there's a lot of fear yeah. there there's yeah. a lot of fear there from that from that portion of of our community um and i often think that there is a real need to really rediscover you know the love of god and that for them um the grace of god for them um that actually you know that fear that they're projecting 
they hold for themselves as well. And so, you know, when I speak about this stuff, it is just as much for, you know, my trans Fano and, and, you know, rainbow Fano as it is for my Fano on the other side who, who yeah. are really living out of this fear and this belief that God is this hateful being. And I mean, they wouldn't even frame God as hateful. They would just say, this is just reality and the way things work. Yeah. Um, but it does have an impact on our mental health and our well being. And, you know, it's a journey I came through myself, you know, so I kind of have an understanding there. Um, but, but I do think it's really heartbreaking. I think it's really heartbreaking mm. that like, even though we have some really beautiful values in the Christian faith that predominantly most of our churches aren't safe places for our rainbow whanau to exist in. Um, mm. And it's, it's such a clash because, you know, a lot of Christians would say they want to be loving, but they, the framework they have to believe doesn't allow them to create safe spaces for rainbow people. And um, it's, it's heartbreaking for me seeing that, that harm, um, people that I love and care about yeah. as well yeah I mean that was I grew up in the church I grew up Presbyterian and went mm. to youth group and that was my main social um out like outlet when I was a teenager was youth group etc and then I just ended up getting into arguments with the the youth leaders I'm like but God loves everyone Jesus loves everyone so why are you telling me that it's wrong to be gay it didn't you know like this doesn't make any sense <laughs> <laughs> just like right. does not compute in the world of love <laughs> yeah, and and i mean this summer i mean there'll be a whole conversation in itself in terms of the yeah. theology of that and how people try to make it make sense but you know i remember myself like i, I came from a far more conservative background and, and i had a lot of fear for people you know and i believed like and i guess just imagine that imagine believing that people that you love and care about like are going to burn in hell for eternity and again most mm. Christians who believe that wouldn't say God's burning you for eternity, just that you're choosing to reject God and reject love so that you're going to hell and you're going to burn for eternity. But that's horrific. You know, it's a really scary worldview to operate out of. And yeah. so you know, that's where we sometimes see quite an extreme response because they believe this literally. And it, I think that's where we see a lot of the harm coming from. That actually it's their good intentions, but the framework they have to live out of causes a lot of harm for people and really hurts people yeah yeah and that's what i'm really interested in I, I think it's happening more and more now is that people are starting to widen the lens and recognize oh we've got all of these different um uh, world views perspectives yeah. on how reality functions and, and what reality is like and if it's true that we have all of these different world views and we want to care for each other does it make sense to just adopt world views that are supportive of community and supportive of caring that's what i'm curious yeah. about you know and this is something i speak about and, and you know i'm really interested in that conversation with, with those in the church around how how they can look at their faith in a way that actually enables them to live it out in, in line with their core values which is unconditional love yeah. um a lot of the things i often talk about is look you know jesus often spoke about like look at the fruit what is the fruit of your theology what is the fruit of the belief system or the worldview you hold and if the fruit is death if it's harm then we need to relook at that because the real core values in, in my faith is love it is unconditional yeah. love it is this message that the divine steps into solidarity with the most poor and oppressed people in the world and and fights for justice and for love and you know opens the doors for all of humanity to join them um, and so if our fruit is not sharing that message, if our faith or theology or our framework of belief is not living mm. up to that message, then maybe we need to rethink some of these details that have yeah. become so important to us. Yeah. And I would say the same on the political social level in terms of if this ideology of neoliberalism is so obviously not delivering for our community as a whole. And when people are like, oh, you've just got to work harder, or it's the personal choices, da, da, da. It's like, we need to change the terms of reference. We need to shift how we see things and maybe adopt a different ideology on a you know social, political level. If you could say anything to the politicians, and you, I know you're talking to the politicians all the time because you are talking to the politicians all the time. Um, let's frame it, frame it in a different way. What would you love to have all of our politicians deeply understand about the way that humans function? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> look, I, I guess I'd first just just like them to, like, outside of the political sound bites, hear 
from the children, the young people, the families that I hear from every day or that I'm you know, in community with about the real harm that is happening in our community, not from an analytical numbers perspective, but from the reality. And if they could get a sense of that harm, you know, I hope that could lead us to a real conversation. Um, I think there, there is a real need for us to come together more as a community and start to ask these big questions together mm. and recognize that actually across the line, we have some shared values that actually, you know, um, love for others, you know, care for, for people, the, the, the idea that actually we, we, we all, I think, want to have a society where, you know, children grow up fed and clothed and in like stable, safe housing, you know, where actually we all want our families to fr thrive and our communities to do well. If we could come together on some of those shared values, then maybe we could re-examine how some of this ideology is played out. But then also the rhetoric. Um, I get really uncomfortable with, you know, we hear it in the media quite a lot, almost being fr the, 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 the politics being framed as this game. It's, it's not a game, you know. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm okay with us having disagreements around how we organize society and disagreements around how we want to talk about stuff. But um, politics is about real people's lives. And there's real people that are suffering and dying because of the inequality that exists in our society. Um, and I think we need to take that a little bit more seriously. And mm. we see some of the political dialogue getting a little bit flippant. You know, you can see people, you know, just lining each other up on both sides and trying to win political brownie points. And 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 that may play for for a certain percentage of the community who, you know, but but I think there's there's more people getting a bit tired of politicking. And I think we want to have far more reasoned debates around what's going on because at the end of it, it's it's real people's lives. Mm. When I feel into that, when I feel into, you know, some of our politicians meeting the young people and, and the families that you're dealing with, I don't know if they're capable at this point of, of literally allowing themselves to feel. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like the, the hearts have been closed down because it's really painful to feel the pain of another, to stand there and allow oneself to feel what someone else is experiencing. I don't think some of the politicians even know how to do that. Yet, no, I mean, some yet, of some yet. of all of us, right? So, you know, yeah. one, of the, one of the interesting conversations I've been involved in this week has been about the right to housing, and you know, you know, what's a basic standard that human beings should be able to live in, you know? And we've been having that big conversation about rental wealths and you know what's appropriate housing to rent out and all that sort of stuff. And uh, it's been such an example of the way, you know, and I would say, capitalism and neoliberalism really dehumanizes us when we start thinking about dollar figures more than we think about yeah. human beings, right? And I think I'd written something that talked a little bit about the struggle that, you know, my family's had just trying to find a safe home. You know, over yeah. the last few months, we've we've struggled to, and we've, we've had property managers very proudly show us houses that just walking in the door, you can sense are not well. You know, I've got kids that have got asthma, I've got asthma myself, you know, you know, it's going to be harmful for their, for their health. We, we've got something like 20 children is something like, oh, I can't remember the exact figures, but you know, huge amounts of children that um that are hospitalized every year so like thirty one thousand or so who are hospitalized every every year due to preventable illnesses resulting from the conditions of the houses that they live in and 20 of those children die that's crazy and yet to that statistic you have people responding saying, well, you shouldn't just, you know, you shouldn't have kids or, you know, um, it's their fault for, you know, they need to get more money or, or you know, just, it's just so the yeah. focus is just so in the response is so inhuman. And I think what has our, what has capitalism done to us that we can think about our dollar values before we can think about the suffering of another. Yeah. Um, and I think housing really, really highlights that fact when we yeah. start to have these conversations yeah the commodification of housing right it's like we have put money on the altar it has become our god yeah. and we we justify making you know the things that we do according to well that's where the most money is rather than that's where the most love is or that's where the most care yeah. is or that's how i can support my community mm. yeah and again like i i don't believe we have to have a society where poverty and homelessness has to exist 
that it's a political choice. Again, we can make decisions, different choices around how we redistribute wealth in the society, you know, um, to ensure that we all have those basic fundamental human needs. And yes, mm. it's going to mean that some people that have a lot of wealth may lose a little bit of it. But at the end of the day, that little bit of wealth that is redistributed is going to be a tiny scratch of the bucket for them and going to be a complete transformation for those on the bottom of our yeah. society. Yeah. So that's a political choice we get to make as a community. Um, mm. What do we really value as a society? Do we value these children? You know, do we value um, the kids that, you know, we get really outraged about when we hear these stories in the media like oh someone should do something well we can do something you know we can end poverty in Aotearoa we can end homelessness we can ensure that we all have enough housing to to do well but we need to make some decisions around how we structure our society and how we distribute the wealth that we have mm. so on that note as we sort of come toward the end of this there's two final questions I want to ask you one is what is your vision for Aotearoa, New Zealand? What, like if you were to talk about what you would love to see or experience in five years, 10 years time, what is your vision for this land? Look, I'd love to see a community that is free of poverty, housing, you know, free of homelessness, where actually communities are connected, where, um, you know, we, we feel a deep connection to the whenua, but also to one another. We're, you know, we're far more connected locally. You know, our communities are actually built physically so that we can be in relationship with one another, where we can build really strong bonds in our local community and we're better equipped to serve one another. I'd like to see a community where we, we've stepped back from this polarization, where we mm. have real honest conversations about the hard stuff without demonizing and dehumanizing each other, but actually recognize the divine image within one another and, and are able to approach difficult conversations with love and empathy and curiosity. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to see a community in a society where, you know, we decide to value people and planet far more than we do and, and, and recognize, um, as I said before, I guess the divine image and, and all that is around us. Mm. Mm, amen to that. Hmm. And for those who might be watching or listening, who may feel an impetus or a desire to, to do something or to be the change, what can people do? How can people respond, particularly those who might be more privileged in our society? Yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, for the most basic level, you know, when you go to vote this election, start thinking about, who are you voting if you're casting your vote for you know how does your vote actually impact um the most marginalized the most structurally marginalized in our society um and, and make that decision for them as well you know at the end of the day a change of government for those who are wealthy and privileged it often doesn't mean too much um but who we put into parliament always often means quite a lot for those who are at the bottom of our society um yeah, I think, you know, looking for those opportunities where there is communities in your space that you're interested in to get involved in, in the work. Um, it could also look like letting your local MPs and ministers know what you value and who you value and what you want them to prioritize. Um, on a more practical level, and I mean, this is probably bigger and harder, is, is thinking about how you live your life. You know, one of the things that I've been really caught into in our community is we, we, we're thinking very intentionally around how we live. You know, we don't just live by ourselves. You know, we have kind of an open home and we live with others and have tried to build a community um, mm. to, to start to push back on that notion of individualism and consumerism. You know, we have an open home where we have young people coming in, staying with us all the time and we live with another couple. And like that intentional community is how we live out our faith. Um, but maybe thinking around what are those experiments you can be doing in your community that push back against individualism, that push back against consumerism, that start to imagine this divine dream in a different way. You know, how can you be a part of, of yeah. you know, experimenting with how we could, how we could live differently? Um, and those are much bigger conversations and things that probably need to happen in your community with those you're connected to. But mm. I think that's how we change things. It's not actually going to come from government. The real change will come from the community as we start reorganizing ourselves, start living differently, start prioritizing, you know, our very human values and start pushing back on this big individualistic capitalist system that has so far organized our lives and, and not for the better. Mm, beautiful. Yeah, and it's it is such a cliche to say be the change, and yet, and yet we are the ones, 
right? And every choice we make, every time we're showing up, yep. we can be that which we want to see in the world. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So, AJ, thank you so much for the mahi that you are doing for the way you are standing up and really living this um, for your Instagram, for your blog, for your podcast, uh, and for just being relentless with it. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yes. That was AJ Hendry, a youth worker, uh, an advocate for ending youth homelessness here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Really beautiful to connect, to hear what he has to say. You know, he's at the coal face of what's going on. And, you know, many of you watching or listening may not know what it's like for some of the more vulnerable and more marginalized people in our society. And that question of, you know, what can I do? And, I, and sometimes I don't think it's about what can I do, but it's more about who do I need to, to be? And I love what he said at the end in terms of like, how can each one of us live our lives pushing back on consumerism, pushing back on capitalism, start to live in an even more interconnected way in a more community oriented way, in a way where we're not worshiping money where we are more deeply caring for each other and loving each other mm. yeah we'd love to hear any thoughts that any of you have on this particular episode of conversations with Carolia. and as always like share follow if there's any particular guests you'd love to see me interview let me know i'm just sending so many blessings so much love to you all Thanks for listening to Conversations with Carolia and trust that you enjoyed that nuanced deep dive into spirituality, sexuality, power and awakening. If you love my take on the spiritual path and you're looking for more insights like this, then make sure you subscribe and like. You can also check out my website, carolia.com. That's K-A-R-A-L-E-A-H.com subscribe to my weekly newsletter.